So um, I'm going to start off. Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody tonight uh, to a very special night. Um, my name is Dave Schumann. I'm a longstanding board member um, and active member of the uh, RESC, the Royal Astronomy Society of Canada, Montreal Centre. I'm really proud to be a member of this very active centre. Um, and uh, we, we have a great, uh, a great uh, speaker for you tonight and, and an amazing, uh, amazing subject matter as well. I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists, uh, like who's with us tonight, uh, uh, starting off with uh, um, uh, David Levy, uh, famous uh, comet hunter and uh, co-founder of the SL9 Comet in 1994. That was uh, pretty uh, amazing. And um, our, our main speaker, Olivia Lim, uh, she's with uh, the uh, IREX project and uh, she'll uh, uh, be discussing in detail um, uh, her uh, research that will be coming with the James Webb Telescope. And uh, our Sunny Salim, who's uh, helping out to moderate uh, in the background. And uh, also um, Karim, who uh, is in the background, uh, but will uh, be helping out uh, um, tonight as well. So um, I'd like to invite the audience to use the chat system to uh, say where you're joining us from. And I've already seen that that's been happening. So we do have an international audience, uh, um, you know, a couple of people from uh, in the States and uh, from different parts of Canada. So it's amazing that with Zoom and this new technology that we can actually stay connected together and really enjoy stuff uh, together from no matter where we're from uh, around the world. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, uh, this technology. And as a center, we uh, promise to continue using this uh, technology to further enhance the fact that uh, other parties from outside the center can actually join us on, on meeting nights and uh, participate, um, um, you know, mainly as if they were there in person. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, share my screen here. And um, okay, uh, okay. So uh, here's the uh, title slide for tonight uh, for tonight's talk: uh, the um, the uh, Trappist One system through the eyes of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, um, uh, kindly um, um, presented by Olivia Lim from the IREX project. But before we start, I'd like to do an acknowledgement. Um, here in Montreal, we, we have the Land and Sky Acknowledgement. And I'd like to say that it's the um, Maple Sap Boiling Moon uh, and from the big, uh, Ojibwe and uh, the uh, Niskisipism, uh, um, pardon my uh, pronunciation, uh, or the Goose Moon from the Cree Nation. And we acknowledge that we are on unceded indigenous lands of the traditional territory of both the uh, Kanene Kanahake or Mohawk and the Anishabag uh, Algonquin peoples. We gratefully, um, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather here and we thank the many generations of people who have taken care of this land and these waters. Uh, Teohateke, Montreal is so historically known as a gathering place for diverse First Nations. Thus we recognize and deeply appreciate the historic and ongoing indigenous connections uh, to and uh, presence on these lands and waters. We also recognize the contributions the Metsi, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening our communities. So together as a diverse community, we commit to building a sincere relationship with the Indigenous peoples based on respect, dignity, trust, and cooperation uh, in the process of advancing the truth and reconciliation. So um, before, before we continue, um, I, uh, I believe uh, David Levy would um, be more than happy to give us his quotation for the uh, event. Yes, thank you so much, David. And uh, I'd like to add my welcome to, this is personally my very favorite astronomy club, the Montreal Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Bienvenue, uh, mesdames et messieurs, uh, la Société Royale Astronomique de Canada, Centre de Montréal. 
tonight's poem, there are going to be two poems uh, by Scotland, Scottish poets, to celebrate spring, which you may not realize is coming, but it is coming even in Montreal. The first is The City of Dreadful Night by James Thompson, written around 1873. The comet hanging over the waste dark seas, the messy rainbow curved in front of it, beyond the village with the masts and trees, the snaky imp dog-headed from the pit, feeling upon its bat-like leathern pinions, her name unfolded in the sun's dominions. The other one is sort of an opposite mood, the pleasures of hope, also by a Scottish poet, Thomas Campbell, written in 1799. At summer's eve, when heaven's ethereal bow spans with bright arch the glittering hills below, why to yon mountain turns the musing eye whose sun bright summit mingles with the sky? And now back to you, David. We're really looking forward to the presentation lecture tonight. Thank you, David. That was amazing. That's uh, David gives us some. Um, um, well, I'd have to say uh, twice a week, uh, these wonderful quotations that have really inspired us and lifted our spirits over the past few years, uh, especially through troubling times and uh, some fun times that are coming uh, more and more ahead. So um, right now I'm gonna talk a little about um, our center and some upcoming events. So let me share that with you. So a little about the Montreal, uh, RSC Montreal Center. Um, we've been around for, um, for a long time and uh, uh, the uh, RAS Montreal Center was established. David, on... your screen isn't shared. Oh, I thought it was uh, shared. Okay, can you guys see it now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, uh, so I'd like to say that the RAS Montreal Center um, was, uh, hold on a second, I think, uh, just bear with me. Okay, so the Rasp Montreal Center was established in 1918. We're a strong, vibrant center with over 160 plus members, and we keep growing. Uh, Bi-weekly events, meetings virtually through uh, through COVID. But uh, as time moves on and things start opening up, we're going to start having meetings in person, and we will continue to have uh, communications via Zoom for people that can't quite make it to Montreal. So I think things will even be better uh, post COVID. So our Bellevue Observatory uh, features, uh, thanks to the grace of the Mead Corporation through David uh, Levy, a donation of 14 inch Mead LX200 by uh, Richie Crutchier and Willy Woods uh, Dark Sky Site that's uh, from uh, John Gamash. Uh, we have a 16 inch Explore Scientific light bucket, which we dubbed the Bumblebee because it's a uh, yellow and black uh, uh, trim. And uh, we have uh, plenty of observing events, workshops, clubhouses at the Bellevue or, uh, or on Zoom. Now at the Bellevue Observatory, which is um, at the Morgan uh, Arboretum, uh, we have uh, Ike Williamson Library at John Abbott College with a really vast uh, um, uh, library of uh, astronomical and, and uh, uh, you know, books about physics and everything. Uh, quite, a, quite a collection going back, you know, going back uh, decades and decades. Uh, telescope rentals and swap sale, uh, we have our um, uh, our newsletter, a regular newsletter, Skyward, which is um, uh, an amazing um, uh, publication. You know, some, sometimes it's like up to 32 pages and it features members' uh, experiences, and it's a really nice way to connect. Uh, monthly public talks and star parties and uh, outreach to local groups and libraries. And you can always reach us on the web at racmontreal.org um, slash titan. So our upcoming events, um, like as we get back into person, uh, we have quite a few upcoming events. So we have our clubhouse Zoom discussions on Wednesday nights. Uh, if there's a no-go because of poor weather, well, that's not going to stop us. We're going to uh, meet uh, on Zoom like we have been for the past few years. And on most Saturday nights on Zoom as well. But we also will start to have more and more events as the months go on. And that usually starts at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And our Citizen Science Monthly on April 13th at eight features our members talking about how regular citizens like us uh, who have a passion for astronomy and science 
can actually help move science forward with, with, uh, with these endeavors. So there's different subject material. And um, you can always reach us by email at info at rscmontreal.org for details. Um, and uh, just to remind you that if you do want to join us, a regular membership is $97 uh, for uh, annual membership. And, and you get the Observer's Handbook from the National Society. You get Sky News, which is a wonderful publication that's on news, uh, newsstands, but you would actually get it uh, directly to you. Um, and you get uh, Skyward, our, our uh, amazing and uh, monthly uh, center newsletter. Uh, youth members are $55.25 and, uh, and from ages 16 to 21. And family is $91.50 for the first member. And additional members uh, per additional adult is 13 and $7.10 per additional youth. And uh, as mentioned before, rscmontreal.org slash Titan slash join us. So our upcoming events, and uh, there's quite a lot of exciting things coming up. So starting off with episode five of Citizen Science Series, uh, Measuring Doubles, Techniques for Amateurs and Astronomers and Citizen Science uh, uh, by Blake Mancaro. Uh, Deep Sky uh, from Downtown, presented by Koa Tran, Wednesday, April 13th, at, uh, from eight to nine uh, Eastern time. And everyone's welcome. And I really highly encourage you to, to join in because these are excellent presentations. And then you can ask questions and interact. It's, it's really a nice thing. Um, you can join us uh, yet again at rscmontreal.org slash Titan. And then upcoming on May the 7th for International Astronomy Day, as many of you know, uh, Artemis, the uh, program that is the sister of Apollo, um, is NASA and partners from around the world, including Canada, the CSA and the ESA, is the, um, the program to return to the moon and to actually stay on the moon with a permanent presence. Um, unlike the old Apollo program, which was canceled in 1972, uh, um, and then the Skylab, um, this time we're going to stay and we're going to find ways to be self-sustaining self on the moon. And to celebrate the launching of Artemis uh, One mission, which is actually live at Cape Canaveral right now, they're testing the fueling of this powerful space launch system rocket actually. So if you Google the SLS NASA, you'll see this rocket is the most powerful of its kind in the world right now. And uh, it's what's gonna be needed to take astronauts back to the moon on the Orion capsule. So to celebrate this whole event of the uh, uncrewed launching that's coming up uh, early this summer, uh, on May the 7th through International Astronomy Day, uh, we have Sketching the Moon. Uh, so learn how to uh, draw lunar craters with specialist Bettina Forge. She's amazing. I'm telling you, if you have no experience with sketching or artwork, You'll, you'll really learn something by the time uh, you, you go through this. It is absolutely stunning. I've done it before and uh, she's absolutely wonderful and a recognized uh, uh, artist and a PhD uh, in her field. And uh, that'll be on April the 14th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And you can register at uh, bit.ly slash craters 2022. And it's hosted by the RAC and National and Montreal Center. And we'll have links for you um, in, in, the, uh, in the chat. Uh, we'll be posting links, uh, thanks to Kareem. He'll be helping out with that. So if you can't remember all this stuff, don't worry, ask and we'll help about it. Um, okay, so on May the 7th, we have the AstroFest uh, at the Rio Tinto Alcan Planetarium. There'll be lots of um, um, things to look at and, uh, and, a panel, and panels that uh, will be, uh, will be um, uh, engaged with. And also a moon and star party in the West Island in the evening. And at the planet term, they'll be observing as well. Um, obviously, uh, weather willing. So guess what we're going to be observing? We're going to be observing the moon. It's a pretty timely subject. And it's always fascinating and beautiful to look at. And uh, we'll have a live stream with the RAC National for this amazing, uh, amazing day on May the 7th. So that said, I will now introduce our guest speaker tonight, Olivia Lim. And Olivia Lim is a PhD student at the Institute for Research on Exoplanets, IREX, at the University of Montreal. Her doctoral research focuses on the TRAPPIST-1 system 
which she'll be sharing us with us tonight, including upcoming observations using the James Webb Space Telescope. Olivia works on the analysis of data from the infrared spectral polarimeter, sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, also known as SPIROU, uh, SPIRU, installed at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. And uh, uh, after the meeting, I, I invite everybody to ask their questions in the chat, and then uh, we'll, we'll be able to have those questions uh, answered. And um, without any further ado, I'd like to present uh, um, Olivia. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Let me try to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. <laughs> Okay, I think this is good. Okay, um, hi everyone, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight and thank you to Karim and the RASC Montreal Center for inviting me. So yes, my name is Olivia. I'm a student at the Institute for Research on Exoplanets at the University of Montreal. And I work under the supervision of Professor René Doyon. And so tonight, uh, we're going to explore an exoplanetary system that's become very close to my heart, and it's called the TRAPPIST-1 system. So um, my plan for tonight is to start by introducing the TRAPPIST-1 system, so what it is and what, why it's so special. And then, as you may or may not know, <laughs> we're going to look at TRAPPIST-1 with a big telescope that was sent to space last Christmas. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. So I'll tell you a bit about this exciting space mission, and then I'll also talk about how we're going to look at TRAPPIST-1 with JWST to search for traces of life outside our solar system, or at least how we're moving towards this goal with uh, JWST. Okay, so um, at this point, I've been talking for like one minute, and I've probably said TRAPPIST-1 more than five times already. Um, so yes, tonight is all about TRAPPIST-1. Um, so I'll start the introduction on this super cool system very shortly. But just before that, I want to say um, just a few words about my research group, the Institute for Research on Exoplanets, or IREX for short. So um, IREX is a group, a growing group of people, um, including students, researchers, professors, and postdocs who study exoplanets. Um, currently, we're about 60 active members at IREX. Um, we're ma mainly from four different universities in the province, Université de Montréal, McGill University, Bishop's U University, and Université Laval. Um, but we also collaborate with many other international organizations for our different projects. Um, and yeah, I like to show pictures of people when I, whenever I give presentations like this, because it reminds us that the research we do is only possible when we work as a team, uh, when we work on projects and try to understand what's going on with our data. We need input from many different people in the team. Um, and everything we know and the telescopes and instruments we use, all of this is based on work that has been done by people somewhere at some point. So I think it's very important to remind ourselves of that. Um, also, if you're interested in exoplanets in general, you can follow IREX on social media, um, go to the website and subscribe to the newsletter if you want. Um, it's not spamming, I promise. I'm subscribed to the IRIS newsletter myself. Um, and yeah, okay, so that's it for the general introduction. Now let's dive into the subject for tonight, TRAPPIST-1. Um, okay, so TRAPPIST-1 is an exoplanetary system. Uh, so just to make sure everyone is on the same page, um, an exoplanet is a planet that orbits around a star other than the sun. So when we say an exoplanetary system, it's just a way to refer to the star and the planet or the planets that are orbiting around the star. So, okay, TRAPPIST-1 is an exoplanetary system. Now we know what this is. Um, so TRAPPIST-1 is located at a distance of about 39 light years away from us. So it would take 39 years to travel to TRAPPIST-1 if we could travel at the speed of light. Um, we cannot travel at the speed of light at the moment. Uh, we're not even close to that, as far as I know. 
Um, so TRAPPIST-1 is not within our reach in the sense that we probably won't be able to travel to TRAPPIST-1 in the next couple of decades. Um, these are all artistic representations of the planets. Um, unfortunately, we don't have beautiful detailed pictures of the planets and the star like this, um, but that's okay. There are many other reasons to be interested in the TRAPPIST-1 system. For example, um, if we start with the star that's at the center of the TRAPPIST-1 system, so the star which is depicted on the left here. So the star that's at the center of TRAPPIST-1 is quite different from the sun. It's much smaller. Um, it's actually just a little bit bigger than Jupiter. And it's also less massive than the sun. Um, its mass is about 9% the mass of the sun. And because it's less massive, uh, the light that the uh, TRAPPIST-1, the star emits, is also less energetic and therefore redder, even redder than the red part of the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. <coughs> Sorry, um, it's actually called infrared light. Um, and those types of stars that are smaller and less massive than the sun and emit light in the infrared domain are called M dwarfs. So the star that's at the center of the TRAPPIST-1 system is an M dwarf. Um, and now, so that's it for the star. Um, now more about the TRAPPIST-1 system itself. So the TRAPPIST-1 system has seven rocky Earth-sized exoplanets that orbit the star. Um, yeah, all seven planets are roughly the same size and roughly the same mass as the Earth. Of course, um, some of them are a bit bigger and more massive, and others are a bit smaller and less massive than Earth, but really they're nothing like giant planets like Jupiter or Saturn. Um, and the seven planets are named in alphabetical order from TRAPPIST-1b to TRAPPIST-1h. Um, in increasing distance from the star. You know, I think uh, one of the reasons why TRAPPIST-1 became so famous is because some of the planets are in the habitable zone of the system. So the habitable zone is the region around a star where um, a rocky planet would have the temperature that's just right for water to exist in liquid form on the surface. So if you imagine a planet that's very close to the host star, um, the planet would be very hot. And so if there were any water on the surface of that planet, it would all evaporate into gas into the atmosphere of the planet and possibly be destroyed by the ultraviolet radiation from the star and then lost to space. And then on the other hand, if we have a planet, a, a planet that's too far from its host star, um, it's going to be so cold that if there were any water on its surface, it would all freeze into ice, which is not the most favorable environment for life to thrive in. So yes, um, Trappist one, some of the TRAPPIST-1 planets are in the habitable zone uh, of the TRAPPIST-1 system, and so they could have um, liquid water on their surface. Um, so that's very exciting in my opinion, um, but there's even more to the TRAPPIST-1 system. So the planets don't just orbit the star in any random way, they transit the star. So all seven planets in the system transit the star. This means that um, as seen from Earth, the planets pass in front of the star periodically. So for example, for TRAPPIST-1b, um, the planets that that's the closest to the star, it takes one and a half days for the planet to go around its star. So every one and a half days, the planet passes in front of the star from our point of view. Um, and just maybe a small parenthesis here. Uh, this is this one and a half days um, uh, is actually called the, the orbital period. So we say that the orbital period of TRAPPIST-1b is one and a half days. And as a reminder, you probably all know this, um, the Earth takes 360 days to go around the sun. So Earth's orbital period is 365 days. Um, and so TRAPPIST-1b, and in fact, all the TRAPPIST-1 planets have orbital periods that are very short compared to um, Earth's orbital period. 
And that's another very interesting aspect of the TRAPPIST-1 system. It's very compact. Um, the planets are very close in to their host star. And now, okay, so that's not, that's not too relevant for the topic that I wanted to discuss tonight. I just wanted to mention it um, as I was talking about orbital periods. So let's just close this parenthesis. Um, and now I wanna spend some time talking about transits because transits are very important in the, the field of exoplanets. Um, okay, so transits. Hopefully you're seeing an animation of transits. So we know that um, a transit is when a planet passes in front of the star, that's what I said. Now, why is it so important, you may wonder? Um, that's because a transit can give us a lot of information, um, in particular information on the planet that's transiting. So when we look at stars like TRAPPIST-1 um, with telescopes, for example, um, what we actually see in the data uh, is something like this. Um, and so we don't actually see the planets passing in front of the star. Uh, that's not a planet, that's probably just a star in the background. That, that's TRAPPIST-1. <laughs> um, so yeah, we don't see planets passing in front of the star. We barely even see the star itself. Um, but we do know that the planets are passing in front of the star because um, when we measure how much light was received in those, I don't know, 16 pixels, um, we see a dip in the light curve. So the amount of light that we receive from the system uh, as a function of time drops when the planet passes in front of the star. Um, and that's because the planet is hiding a fraction of the surface of the star. So uh, you can probably guess uh, what happens to the slide curve when a bigger planet transit the, transits the star. Um, so in this video, uh, the, the video first shows like, let's say a, an Earth-sized planet transiting a star, and we see the corresponding light curve with a dip. And then it's gonna show a Jupiter-sized planet transiting the same star. And so I'll let it play. And you can notice that there's a deeper dip in the light curve when the planet is bigger. So we can I'll try to get the final image. That's what I want. Um, yeah. All right, so we can measure the depth of this dip in the light. We call it the transit depth. And from the transit depth, we can infer the size of the planet compared to the star. Um, and this is actually how we found out that the TRAPPIST-1 planets are approximately the same size as our planet Earth. So, okay, um, transits are fun because they can tell us about uh, how big or how small a planet is compared to its star. But the fun doesn't stop here. Um, transits actually allow us to study atmospheres of exoplanets. I can do this. <laughs> yeah, um, so you might wonder why atmospheres could be important, but um, studying exoplanet atmospheres is currently the most promising and maybe the only realistic method to search for biological signatures on exoplanets. Um, for now, we don't plan on sending any physical satellites near the TRAPPIST-1 planets to take pictures, let alone land on those planets. So atmospheres are really the best avenue to study those planets in more detail to look for traces of life. Um, and also remember that the atmosphere on Earth is essential for life. Um, it protects us against the UV radiation from the sun. It contains the oxygen that we're breathing. Um, it makes sure the water can stay liquid on the surface of the, of the earth and it keeps our planets at a uh, temperature uh, reasonable enough for life to exist. Um, so that's why we're interested in atmospheres. They're currently a very good avenue at better understanding exoplanets and they are essential for life as we know it. Um, okay, so back to transits. Uh, you can imagine that if a rocky planet like earth does not have an atmosphere, it's, it's a ball of rock and its transit is gonna look exactly like 
the light curves that I just showed. But um, if a planet does have an atmosphere, it's going to make the planet look bigger because the atmosphere is not completely transparent. So it's going to contribute in hiding the light of the star during the transit. And um, atmospheres are made of different atoms or molecules in gas form. And these atoms and molecules absorb light at very specific wavelengths. So you can think of wavelengths as the different colors of light. So um, when we look at the sun, we can actually decompose the light of the sun into its different colors or wavelengths. And, and that's actually what we call a spectrum. Um, so yes, atoms and molecules absorb light uh, at very specific wavelengths. So um, here's another video that's explaining what I'm trying to say. Um, so some wavelengths are being absorbed by whatever is in the atmosphere of this exoplanet and other wavelengths are not absorbed, so they get transmitted. So for those wavelengths, where, uh, wavelengths when we're going to look at the transit, the light is going to be blocked out. And then when we look at this wavelength instead, uh, if we look at the transit, then the light is not going to be blocked up. So the, the planet is going to look smaller in this wavelength and bigger in this wavelength. Um, so what does that look like uh, when we look at the transit light curve? Um, here's, oops, I can do this. Here's another video. Thank you, NASA JPL Caltech, for all these beautiful videos. Um, so this video is showing basically a transit light curve at different wavelengths, um, so different colors, if you prefer. So microns here are just uh, the, the wavelength units, um, so different colors, different numbers of microns. And I'll be quiet. You can notice how at some wavelengths, the atmosphere appears thicker. Um, and that's because the atmosphere of the planet absorbs more at that wavelength. And it could be, for example, because there is more of that particular atom or molecule that absorbs at that specific wavelength in the atmosphere. So in other words, um, when we look at transits, if we use the right instruments, of course, we can get the wavelength dependent size of the planet um, compared to its star. And this is actually what we call transit spectroscopy um, because we end up with a spectrum. So light decomposed in its different colors. Uh, we end up with a spectrum of the planet's atmosphere. And so we basically get the size of the planet as a function of wavelength. And we can use this transit spectrum to infer what atoms or molecules are present in the planet's atmosphere because those atoms and molecules are gonna leave their signature in this, the transit spectrum. And this is exactly what we plan to do with the James Webb Space Telescope uh, and our program on TRAPPIST-1. Okay, so um, at this point, I feel like I gave you maybe a lot of information. So let me just um, try to summarize, not do this, <laughs> and try to summarize uh, what I've said so far, and then we'll talk about James Webb. Okay, so first thing, very important, uh, TRAPPIST-1 is an exoplanetary system made of seven Earth-sized, rocky, transiting exoplanets that orbit uh, around a red dwarf star, and some of the planets are in the habitable zone of the system, making it a very interesting system to study um, to look for traces of life outside our solar system. Um, and also the fact that the TRAPPIST-1 planets transit their host star is very important because transits give us the wavelength dependent size of a planet compared to its host star. And this is what we call transit spectroscopy. And a consequence of that is that transits can give us information on the atmosphere of exoplanets. Um, actually transits can tell us about many other things um, that we probably don't have time to discuss right now, but I'd be happy to talk about it more in the Q&A session. Okay, uh, great. <laughs> if you made it this far without falling asleep, congratulations. So now we're gonna start talking more about uh, James Webb. 
So don't worry, everything we discussed so far is relevant for what we're going to talk about next. Um, I just wanted to set the scene and make sure everyone is on the same page um, before we talk about the more exciting stuff. Okay, so James Webb. Um, as you may know, astronomy is one of the oldest sciences and over time, astronomers have developed more and more sophisticated methods to collect information about planets, stars, and galaxies that are around us. Um, and so there are several ground-based telescopes um, around the world that collect data every night uh, as we're speaking right now. But another way of learning more about the universe is sending telescopes to space, like we did uh, for the James Webb Space Telescope. So Webb um, is an international collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. Um, whenever we talk about Webb, we like to say that it's the most complex and powerful space telescope ever built. <laughs> it has a big golden mirror that's 6.5 meters wide, um, and it will study the universe in infrared light. So again, infrared light, that should ring a bell. TRAPPIST-1 emits light in infrared, so keep that in mind. Um, so yes, Webb has a huge mirror and it will look at the universe in infrared light. So Webb will be able to look farther back in time and detect light from the earliest stars and galaxies. And I think one very cool thing to know is that Canada has contributed the Fine Guidance Sensor or FGS in the Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph, or NEARIS for short. And NEARIS is one of the four scientific instruments uh, on board James Webb. And I'll talk a bit more about these two contributions later on, but um, it's, it's important to know that these contributions give us Canadian researchers um, observation time on the telescope. Um, so Webb has four main science goals. Um, the first one is called Other Worlds. Um, so looking outwards from Earth, Webb will be observing some of the planets uh, of our own solar system and some of their moons as well. And farther away from home, uh, we know over 5,000 exoplanets with likely thousands more to discover. And Webb will be looking at some of those planets uh, and systems during its mission. Um, the, si the second science goal is studying life cycle, uh, the life cycle of stars. Um, so certain areas are known as star nurseries, star forming regions like the red portion in this image. Um, and Webb will give us new insight um, about how stars begin to form, evolve over their lifetime and how they run out of fuel and eventually die. Um, and the third science goal of the James Webb Space Telescope is studying the early universe. So Webb will be looking back in time to observe some of the oldest light of the, of the, the early universe. And then the fourth science goal is studying galaxies over time. Because, um, yeah, because Webb's powerful gaze acts like a time machine, allowing us to see the universe as it used to be a very long time ago, the telescope will allow us to observe galaxies uh, over time. So now let's come back to the Canadian contributions to Webb because it's important to highlight this. So the two Canadian instruments were built by the Canadian company ComDev, which is now a division of Honeywell. Um, the first instrument that I mentioned, the Fine Guidance Sensor, or FGS, uh, this one will allow Webb to determine its own position in space and locate and track the targets that it's supposed to observe and also remain steady with very high precision on specific targets. So um, the Fine Guidance Sensor will play a very important role in all scientific observations made by Webb and it will help stabilize the telescope to ensure that the collected images are very clear and detailed. And then um, the second instrument that I mentioned, uh, NEARIS, Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph, this one will allow us to look at distant galaxies, uh, examine faint light sources close to bright objects, and also do something that you are now very familiar with, 
um, determine the composition of exoplanet atmospheres. So NERIS is going to use different techniques to do this, but one of them is transit spectroscopy, which you are also very familiar with now. Um, yeah, okay, so we, we already talked about transit spectroscopy, but um, now I want to focus more on how it's done in practice. Um, so when, when the planet passes in front of the star, uh, the light from the star gets filtered through the atmosphere of the planet, and then the role of the James Webb Space Telescope is to, well, first of all, collect all that light with its big golden mirror, and then once the light has been collected, it gets dispersed um, or decomposed into its different colors, as we said earlier. That's, um, this part is the job of the scientific instruments. Um, yeah, so uh, NEARIS is one of the, the, so one of the two Canadian instruments, NEARIS uh, can disperse light. It has um, what, <laughs> what's needed to disperse light. And, um, but there's also uh, NEARSPEC and MIRI. Um, so those are two other near infrared and infrared instruments that are on the James Webb Space Telescope. And so to speak very loosely, uh, those instruments act as the prism in the, 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 this drawing. So we can choose any one of those instruments to disperse the light that we receive. And so those instruments will dec decompose the light so that we can get a spectrum of whatever we're observing. It can be the planet's atmosphere or a star. Um, so for tonight, we're interested in planet atmospheres. Um, and so this planet atmosphere spectrum uh, contains essentially fingerprints of the different molecules in the planet's atmosphere. And so once this has been done, so once the data has been collected by James Webb, uh, the telescope and its instruments, um, our job on Earth is to analyze the data. And by that, I mean uh, compare those spectra with simulated spectra of planet atmospheres. So, okay, so the, the process of simulating a planet atmosphere spectrum or spectra um, is a whole other subject. Um, there are astronomers who work specifically on developing these simulated spectra. Um, but basically uh, how it works is we first decide on the different inputs or ingredients that uh, we want to put in our simulated atmosphere. So for example, we can say uh, we want this amount of water vapor, this amount of another molecule, uh, this temperature and so on. Um, so, and so we specify a bunch of, of things, ingredients to put in our, our uh, atmosphere spectrum. And then we put all these ingredients into a model. So a model is um, a series of calculations that take all those ingredients um, and produce a simulated atmospheric spectrum. Um, so in this cooking analogy, the simulated atmospheric spectrum would be like the final meal, spaghetti. Um, which is the result of a complex mixing and interactions between the different ingredient ingredients that we put uh, initially. Okay, so in reality, a model a model produces an atmospheric spectrum, not spaghetti. Um, so then, if we compare this simulated spectrum to the actual observed spectrum of the planet atmosphere. And if we see that it's a good match or a good fit, then we may be able to say, oh, well, the inputs that we initially gave to the model are probably representative of the real conditions that are on the planet's atmosphere. And that's how we characterize a planet's atmosphere. That's how we find out uh, that the, the atmosphere is made uh, what the atmosphere is made of and what are the physical conditions in the atmosphere. So I'm oversimplifying things here. Um, in reality, the data is always messy and the comparison part is messy, but the general idea is here. So that's 
generally how we analyze trends in spectroscopy data and how we plan to do it with the James Webb data. And this is this is what we want to do with um, TRAPPIST-1, the TRAPPIST-1 planets using the James Webb Space Telescope. We want to do transit spectroscopy of the TRAPPIST-1 planets. And so um, our very first goal is to determine whether the planets have an atmosphere or not, because we don't know that for sure yet. <laughs> we know they likely don't have like very thick atmospheres because we would have been able to see such thick atmospheres with existing observations from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but we're still not able to say for sure whether the planets are just balls made of rock with no atmosphere or if they're balls of rock with a thin layer of atmosphere like on Earth. Um, and then if we do find that some of the planets or all of them have um, an atmosphere, we hope to go a little further and be able to tell what molecules are present in those atmospheres. Um, so I know that I'm saying this like that, and it may not seem like much, but it's a very important step towards the ultimate goal of searching for traces of life outside the solar system. Uh, remember what I said earlier, atmospheres are currently our best shot at looking for traces uh, for, of life as we know it outside the solar system. Um, okay, but now I have to say that TRAPPIST-1 is a very popular system. Uh, so several teams around the world are gonna look at TRAPPIST-1 to do transit spectroscopy with the Webb telescope. Um, but if we combine all the JWC programs on TRAPPIST-1 together, Webb is going to look at all the TRAPPIST-1 planets in transit with a grand total of 24 transits within the first year of its mission, if everything goes as planned. So um, yeah, Webb is also going to look at um, something else called eclipses, which I didn't have time to discuss. But basically eclipses, um, an eclipse is when the planet passes behind the star instead of in front of the star, uh, like in transits. And eclipses are very complementary to transits in the sense that they give different types of information on the planet. Um, and also there are, there are many reasons why we need to observe multiple, transit, um, multiple transits for each planet. Uh, but one of the main reasons is to get um, a better precision on the transit spectrum. Um, it's the same principle as when you try to take a picture of the night sky with a camera, typically um, you need to stare at the sky with your camera um, for mul multiple seconds or minutes uh, to accumulate more photons so the image looks better. Um, but here the only difference is that we can't just stare at TRAPPIST-1 indefinitely because we're interested in transits which happen every orbital period. And so that's why we're planning to stack multiple transits together to get a better transit spectrum in the end. Um, now, my personal contribution to this uh, is that my team and I uh, submitted a proposal to observe some of the TRAPPIST-1 planets back in November of 2020. Um, we asked for two transits of pla planets B, C, G, and H, um, and our proposal was accepted. So. Um, among those 24 transits that Webb will observe during its first year, eight of them are transits um, that were asked for Montreal, <laughs> yay. Um, and at this point, probably you're wondering, like, what are we gonna find with those data? Are we gonna detect anything, any specific molecules like water? And um, I always struggle to answer this because I think it's better to be cautious and say that we don't know what we're going to find until we actually find it. And even if we do find something, we'll still have to be very careful and make sure that we're not just detecting some residuals from another source like the star. Um, I know it's a disappointing answer, but I think we have to be patient and wait until we actually have the data and we analyze it instead of speculating on what we could see. Um, that's my very anxious voice speaking. And now that I've said this disclaimer, if you're very curious and you don't mind looking at um, nerdy plots, 
I can show you a figure um, that we actually put in the proposal that we submitted to get those eight transits. Um, if you don't like nerdy plots, just, I guess, close your eyes. Ignore this for a while. Um, okay, so here we go. This is the plot. Uh, so I know I should never show a messy plot like this during a public talk, but um, I'm pretty sure you can understand it with all the foundation that I gave earlier. Um, so here we go. So first of all, we're only going to talk about um, the curve that's at the bottom with the blue data points. So we're just going to ignore the top. And remember that all of this is simulated. Um, none of this is real data, of course, because uh, James Webb has not observed Chappis one yet, uh, to my knowledge. So this is um, a transit spectrum. So remember, the light from the star passes through the atmosphere of the planet. The molecules absorb the light at some wavelengths and transmit the light at other wavelengths. And so the planet looks bigger or smaller depending on the wavelength. And so this axis is actually just the size of the planet relative to its star. And this axis is wavelength or the color of the light, if you prefer. And so the black curve is a simulated planet atmosphere spectrum. So again, we decided on some ingredients. We gave the ingredients to a model and the model produced this simulated planet atmosphere spectrum. Um, and then the blue data points are the data that we expect to have from NEARS, the Canadian instrument, knowing the, the performance of this instrument and assuming that we look at two transits of TRAPPIST-1b with James Webb. So that's the kind of transit spectrum we can hope for. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so that's the kind of transit spectrum we can hope for. Um, now, the molecules of the planet's atmosphere, um, because they absorb and transmit light at specific wavelengths, they leave a particular signature in the transit spectrum. And that's identified by uh, the little labels that I put, so H2O, H2O, CO2, CO2. Um, and those, so those, those little bumps and wiggles in the transit spectrum, those are the signatures of the different molecules that we um, initially put in the model. So the idea in the proposal was to say, um, assuming that the ingredients that we put in the model are correct, here is what we could see with the nearest uh, instrument with JWST. So from this, we can say that um, if TRAPPIST-1b has this type of atmosphere with these ingredients, um, then we should be able to detect CO2 and H2, so water, um, from two transits of uh, TRAPPIST-1b with NEARS. And we basically did the same exercise for planets C, G, and H. Um, and assuming that the, this, the simulated spectra that we used are representative of what's really actually on those planets, then we could also detect CO2 and water on TRAPPIST-1c and CO2 and ozone on planets G and H. Um, but again, <laughs> my cautious voice is coming back. This is assuming a lot of things, and we still need to actually get the data to have a beginning of an answer. Um, okay, so that was the, I guess, the nerdiest part of the presentation. Um, I just want to say that uh, there's also another team based here in Montreal, which I'm also part of, that got the two transits of TRAPPIST-1D and the five transits of TRAPPIST-1F. So yes, um, as you can see, IREX is going to be heavily involved in studying TRAPPIST-1 with JWST, and that's a very good thing for us. Um, okay. So like I said, at the beginning of the presentation, all of this was, is, and is going to be a big team effort. Um, these are all members of IREX who are related to their James Webb Space Telescope project. Uh, some of these people have been involved for several years. Some others are newer to the field and will keep having younger and younger researchers join us. Um, but really everyone's contribution is important. So I wanted to make sure to include a picture of everyone in this presentation. Okay, um, so that's 
That's all I had to say. If you made it this far without falling asleep, congratulations again. You deserve a cookie or a spaghetti, whatever you want. Um, so I tried to summarize uh, the presentation in two take-home messages. I guess you're already at home. So two key messages. Um, first, TRAPPIST-1 is a system made of seven Earth-sized rocky transiting exoplanets, some of which could have liquid water on their surface because they're in the habitable zone of their system. And during the first year of its mission, the J James Webb Space Telescope will look at a total of 24 transits of the TRAPPIST-1 planets to study their possible atmospheres with a method called transit spectroscopy. And this will involve many researchers from Montreal. Um, so with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And I can try my best to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia, for the great presentation. It was very, very form, uh, informational. Uh, to start off our questions, we will start off with David's Prigom's question. In what constellation is TRAPPIST-1? Uh, it's in the constellation of Aquarius, but quite honestly, I would not be able to point at the constellation of Aquarius in the night sky. Uh, as a, an astronomer, I'm very, I'm very bad at looking at the, sky, the sky and locating myself, um, but I think you guys are very good at this. <laughs> you probably know better than me where Trappist one is in the sky. <laughs> and the second question we have is from Big Bang is what is the origin of the name Trappist one? Right, so Trappist, okay, so Trappist is actually the name of the telescope that discovered Trappist one, the system. Um, so Trappist is an acronym for I can never remember because it's super long, but um, I think it's transiting planetesimals and small planet telescope or something like this. I'm very sorry. I should know this at this point, but I don't know. It's so long. I can never remember, but it's an acronym. Um, and also something cool to know is that uh, TRAPPIST-1, TRAPPIST, I guess the telescope and TRAPPIST-1, the system, um, they, they are, their origin is from Belgium uh, or actually the the, the team was led by a Belgian astronomer and Trappist is also the name of a Belgian beer. And so I think that's why they kind of arranged, arranged their acronym so that it would give Trappist. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the next question is from- Arsani? Yes? Arsani, can you try to increase the volume of your mic? Sure. Just give me one second. Is this better? All right, thank you. Much better. So uh, this next question is from Carl uh, Petrush. Uh, what if the transit is lower in the uh, in the equator instead of in the uh, in front of the equator of the star? Uh, what if it was closer to the pole? Would can we still uh, determine the planetary size? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for Trappist one planets uh, specifically, we know pretty precisely where the, the transits are happening. So where, uh, with respect to the equator, um, if I remember correctly. So TRAPPIST-1b I know for sure is transiting very close to the equator, um, but I know for TRAPPIST-1f, for example, it's not exactly at the equator. Um, and the effect of that is that it's going to sh change the shape of the transit light curve. So the the curve that I showed earlier showing the dip in light as a function of time. Um, in, in very limiting cases where the planet is just grazing like the very bottom of the star, I think it becomes more difficult to determine the, the size of the planet uh, compared to its star. Um, but that's not the case for the TRAPPIST-1 planets. Thank you. And the next question is from Robert Fleury. Uh, is the transit graphic intended to show the correct scale? Um, probably not. Uh, <laughs> those are plots uh, made for for visualization mostly. Um, it depends which plot. I honestly did not check if, if, if everything was to scale. It's probably not to scale. <laughs> All right, thank you. And then we have a question 
uh, the question is, do the spect uh, spectroscopy models take into account any interstellar any interstellar reddening of the light traveling from TRAPPIST-1, or is the system close enough to us that we can ignore that? Yeah, I think, if, if I remember correctly, I think the system is indeed close enough to Earth to ignore uh, reddening due to interstellar media. Um, I know for sure the modeling part does not include the reddening. I think this is done afterwards, um, after modeling the spectrum, if we need to account for any reddening, this would be done outside of the, the model that I explained. Right. And for the next question from Bing Huang, going from spectra to components, is the solution unique? Um, there, there are degeneracies. Uh, I don't think I'm, I'm good enough to explain this at this point, um, but I think, yeah, there are degeneracies in the sense that you could have two different parameters. If you, for example, if you increase one um, and lower another one, it would have the effect of like increasing this one and lowering the other one. Um, I think that's a, a common problem in, in the science that we do. Um, but yeah, if, if you have, I guess if, the person who has a question has a very specific idea in mind. I could try to answer um, an email, maybe. <laughs> but uh, other than that, I don't think I can provide a more specific answer. But I think, yeah, I think if the question is generally um, if there could be degeneracies, I think the answer would be yes. Um, and that's something we have to be careful about. Yeah. And and the next question is, will the uh, a JWST um, instruments time, uh, time resolution and observe, observed flux level be sufficient to get the atmospheric pressure of scale height? Oh, God. Uh, I mean, we did the simulations. Um, that's what we put in the proposal. Um, there are also a couple of uh, publications that try to estimate this. I don't know if it's specifically to measure the pressure still light, but it's uh, those publications were specifically working on, like given the, the, the performance of the JWST instruments, um, which are fairly well known, what are we able to detect in terms of planet atmospheres? Um, I could probably provide you with links to that, um, but I, since I'm not the author of all those papers or any of those papers, I don't know the details. Um, but there are very detailed studies about what specifically can be done with the JWST instruments, um, taking into account everything we know about those instruments. And the next question is, uh, if say TRAPPIST uh, was uh, actually Earth, what would we see? What uh, would be able to conclude? Sorry, TRAPPIST G. So if TRAPPIST 1G were exactly like Earth in terms, I guess in terms of like atmosphere. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember trying to assume that TRAPPIST-1G would have an Earth-like atmosphere and run the simulations to see exactly what we would be able to detect. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer. Thank you. And uh, this is a lot of, the, of a long question. And using a limited portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, such as in the case, the near-infrared, does that limit the type of chemicals that can be detected in the exoplanet atmosphere in terms of where the optimal uh, absorbance or reflection occurs with the electromagnetic spectrum? In other words, what if the optimal detection of certain chemicals lies outside that of the near infrared, then would that prevent their detection? Um, okay, the answer is yes, in, in the sense that if you have a molecule or an atom that only has its signature outside of whatever spectral coverage uh, the, instru the GWC instruments have, then of course you won't be able to detect those molecules. But um, the argument for observing TRAPPIST-1 in the infrared is because TRAPPIST-1 is emits most of its light in the infrared. So even if we were to observe TRAPPIST-1 
in the wavelengths that correspond to those molecules that only emit outside of the infrared, we would have so little signal from TRAPPIST-1, the system, that it would become very difficult to detect anything at all, even if the, those molecules have their signatures in those spectral domains. Thank you. And for the next question is, do we have any idea when the first data results will be published? Um, so, okay, I'm gonna speak for, for our proposal because that's what I know the, the best. Um, it all depends on when the transits are actually going to be observed. Uh, so the initial plan for us was to start observing in June. Uh, I cannot remember. It's not clear in, in my mind uh, at what point we're actually going to observe because it depends on how all the commissioning part is going. Um, but for our program that we submitted, uh, we have zero exclusive, exclusive access period. So that means as soon as the data comes in, it's available to everyone. So everyone can download the data. Um, so I guess as soon as the data becomes available, you will have access to the data. And our next question is, will uh, Eclipse uh, spectroscopy uh, improve or add to transit data, possibly more of a direct reading from the planet? Um, okay, so I'm not an expert an expert in eclipse spectroscopy. Um, I know it adds, it's complementary in the sense that we're not probing the, the same regions. So for a transit, uh, if you just think about the geometry, the transit probes like the terminator, the terminator region of the atmosphere. So that's like the transit transition between the day side and the night side of the planet. Um, for eclipse spectroscopy, you're looking at the day side of the planet. So just, you're basically looking at the planet just before it gets hidden by the star. So you're looking at the day side of the planet. Um, I know it's common to say that eclipse spectroscopy also gives you, um, I think like because the light is going through a deeper, a deeper, like deeper layers of the atmosphere, you're probing different regions as well. Um, so I think that answers part, <laughs> partly the question at least, but I'm not an expert in eclipse spectroscopy. Right, thank you. And for our last question, uh, Santiago Lopez says, nice graphs. Are there any other, are there many steps involved in processing the data? <laughs> yes, many steps. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a very long process, um, and that's the case not only for the James Webb data, uh, for I think for all data in, in astronomy and probably all the sciences in general. Um, yeah, I definitely talked about how we're going to collect data and end up with magically end up with a clean planet atmosphere spectrum, but in reality, I think a huge part of the work is going to be about going from the raw spectra that we get from, from the instruments to a clean transit spectrum. Um, this can be on timescales of like several months maybe, for just, just working on the raw data to get a clean transit spectrum. So yes, many steps, and probably most of those steps we're gonna have problems, and that's how it is in research. We always have a lot of uh, challenges when we're looking at data. Um, but that's, that's where the fun is. <laughs> thank you. That was our last question. And thank you, Olivia, again, for answering all of our questions. You're muted, David. Sorry. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Arsani for uh, doing a fantastic job tonight of hosting the Q&A session. And, um, and most definitely, we want to thank Olivia for sharing um, her project with us tonight, and it was an amazing presentation, um, a lot of information, a lot of exciting stuff for Canada, especially Montreal, to look forward to, like on the world science scene. Um, it's amazing the stuff that we do here, and it all starts with uh, the teams of people that you have, and I love that you put all of those faces so that we are reminded of not just these acronyms and things, but these are real people that are working very hard behind the scenes for uh, the research to happen for this most amazing uh, project. And um, I'd also like to thank uh, David uh, for the excellent um, um, uh, reading tonight. And also Karim for uh, all of the behind the scenes stuff uh, to get this uh, evening to be put together. 
So it's a, it's a really amazing thing. Um, so I'd also like to say that um, uh, it, I'd like to invite the audience uh, to join us for a more informal chat when this is over, we'll switch over uh, to 